Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Art for Tomorrow Talks. I'm the president of the Democracy and Culture Foundation, which is the organization that uh, convenes Art for Tomorrow in association with the New York Times. I'm delighted that we're here back in Doha, which is all where it started uh, back in 2015. Um, with uh, the New York Times and Qatar Museums as a founding supporter, uh, uh, bringing Art for Tomorrow to the world. And when we got together with uh, Her Excellency Sheikha Mayasa to think up of the theme, we felt that it was time to bring to the art world and the globe at large a conference um, and an event that went beyond collecting and investing in art and looking at art as a catalyst for social development and economic development. And you know, six years later, this becomes much more relevant. Uh, with the uh, pandemic, there's been an acceleration of the other pandemics of inequality, migration shifts, climate, and the misuse of technology. And in very many ways, this is what we're covering this year at Art for Tomorrow Talks. Uh, it's the social impact. And uh, we have a great program that uh, Kim Conniff Tabor, our editorial director, has put together. Um, four panels that look at social impact. Uh, Farah Nagari, our culture writer, is moderating social impact and, and why art matters. She will now moderate uh, identity and the issue of race in art. And then Matt Anderson, uh, the uh, European culture editor for the New York Times, uh, will moderate uh, a, a panel on crisis and the relationship of art and crisis and politics and technology. So it's a nice, rich program we're bringing together. I'd like to thank Qatar Museums for being our founding partner. We have other sponsors, CC Panorama International. Hopefully we'll see a panorama here in Doha one of these days. Qatar Airways and uh, of course the W Hotel and this space that we're in now is in a way a legacy of uh, Art for Tomorrow because it was created as a result of the event that took place here uh, five, six years ago. So without uh, further ado, uh, I'll turn over to Farah. Please ladies and gentlemen, switch off your phones uh, and, and uh, let's hear from Farah and uh, her esteemed panel. Thank you so much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to you from the Art for Tomorrow conference. It's wonderful to be back here in Doha. My name is Farah Nayeri, and I'm a culture writer for the New York Times, um, and I'm also an author. Uh, before I get started, I was wondering if I could ask you all to switch off your mobile phones, because that way we won't we have uh, four panels today, and you know it'd be nice to um, to have the phones switched off. Thank you so much for that. The theme of this very first panel is why art matters. And to frame the conversation, I thought that I would start by defining what art is, or at least trying. And I found that there seem to be almost as many definitions of art as there are people populating this earth. Every human being seems to have their own definition of art, which makes it a very beautiful thing, but also a very difficult thing to define. Andy Warhol, as you probably know, famously said, making money is art, and working is art, and good business is the best art. That was Andy's definition. And he also said, art is what you can get away with. The American author James Baldwin said, the purpose of art is to lay bare the questions that have been concealed by the answers. It took me a while to get my head around that one. <laughs> I'll leave it with you. And the choreographer Twyla Tharp had an answer that you might find interesting. She said, art is the only way to run away without leaving home. Now, for hundreds of millions, if not billions of us, who have gone through these pandemic times, that definition probably sounds quite appropriate, because 
art became indeed the only way for us to run away without leaving home. And through drawing, painting, music, poetry, dance, literature, online performance, we got a sense of glorious escape from the stifling confines of our own homes. But still, you know, art remains to me a mystery and a very personal and individual thing. So I thought that to get the conversation started, I would turn to my first speaker, who I hope we will be getting on screen shortly, um, the award-winning Turkish novelist Elif Shafak. Elif, a very, very warm welcome to you. I'm sure all of you know Elif. Um, she's a, a, an author of extraordinary renown. I'm reading her current novel. It's absolutely exquisite. It's called The Island of Missing Trees. So that's a plug for Elif. Um, Elif, I just thought I'd throw it out there. So what is art to you? Well, wow, thank you so much. It's so wonderful to, to share this platform together. Um, I think art for me is a longing, you know, it's a quest. It's also a rebellion. It's a longing for a sense of home, belonging, a homeland. Sometimes storyland is your homeland. And in particular, the art of storytelling for me is, of course, the quest for stories, the love of stories and language and words. But I also think it is the love or, or, or attention towards silences. So what I'm trying to say is if you're a writer, if you're a novelist, you're not only interested in stories, but I think you're equally interested in or drawn to silences and people who have been silenced. I see. And so why does it matter to have art in our lives? I know it matters very much to you. Obviously, it's your, you know, oxygen. It's you couldn't live without it, and so many of us couldn't either. But, I mean, looking beyond yourself and your life as a storyteller, why does art matter? Why should we care? Oh, it, it, it does matter enormously, and I think we need to say this clearly, out loud, especially at a time like this, as we're going through this pandemic, and many politicians, unfortunately, uh, are under the illusion that art and culture are a luxury that can be discarded. You know, they, they behave as if you do not have to invest in arts. When you shut down a library, that has political consequences. It has social consequences. When you take away these spaces, cultural spaces, in which we can hear each other's voices, have nuanced conversations, slow down. If you take these away, that has major consequences. So my point is, I think the age we're living in is not an easy age at all. It is full of uncertainties, anxieties. It is the age of angst, like an existential angst. And we all deal with lots of negative emotions. But this world would be a much more difficult place to live in if from an age of angst, we move into an age of apathy. There's one emotion that really scares me and that's the lack of all emotions, numbness. The moment we stop caring about each other's stories. So that's where art and literature comes into the picture. They punch holes in these walls of numbness that have been erected around us. Through art and literature, we learn to connect and care. And then you realize the person you might have seen as your other is actually your brother. You know, the other is my sister. I am the other. So it melts down those dualities. And, and I, I'm scared that the age we're living in is evolving towards an age of apathy. In order not to experience that, we need art. Right, and I mean, before I turn to Jana, I just wanted to ask you if you've seen sort of evidence of this destruction in the cultural world. If you've seen you know, institutions around you closing down, you know, uh, performers, artists, creative uh, individuals being losing their livelihood, what has been your experience of this pandemic and its impact on culture? It is so interesting, isn't it? I mean, not that long ago, there was so much optimism in the world, late 1990s, early 2000s, you would remember, I remember, um, people were thinking that this was a triumph of liberal democracy, thanks to the proliferation of digital technologies, everyone was going to have a voice. And there was so much faith back then in digital platforms that people would name their children Facebook. Now, fast forward where we are right now, I think that feeling has evaporated. And, and now we know that 
uh, actually many people feel voiceless. So that is incredibly important, you know, to understand, respect basic human dignity, but also understand that inequalities matter and everything is interconnected. If we care about climate injustice, it means we also care about gender injustice. You know, if you care about the planet, you, it means you care about inequality. So all I'm trying to say is there are connections. And as human beings, we're all interconnected. We have massive global challenges ahead of us, whether it's the possibility of another pandemic, whether it's ecological crisis, cyber yeah. terrorism. But so what, what's, the the role, role, what's the role of culture there? The role of culture is, first of all, to show those connections and empathy. I think empathy is like a muscle. The more we use it, the better we become at it and also it gives you maybe an intellectual humility we tend to think that we're the center of the of the world you kindly mentioned my novel the island of missing trees for me it's a novel that shows that we're part of an ecosystem we're not above the world we're not the center of the universe right and when we human beings destroy each other we're also destroying an entire habitat around us so art is primarily about rehumanizing people who have been dehumanized, bringing the periphery to the center, showing us what was left invisible, um, but also caring about inequalities, basic human dignity, and doing this in such a way that goes beyond borders. Mm -hmm. That's a good definition. Thank you, Elif. We've got a new definition to add to our compendium. Um, Jana, uh, Jana Bure Tavernier, you are the co-founder and executive director of Fine Acts, and you are a very prominent Bulgarian um, activist who works in the realm of art and culture. Th through your activism, you have a TED Talk, you have several TED Talks, but one of them, I'm terribly jealous, has about two million viewers. So I recommend you go and look up Jana Bure Tavernier on your YouTube when you get home. Um, so, the question that I put to Alif is one that I would like to put to you, you know, what is art to you, Jana? First of all, uh, Farah, I'm, so, to speak louder. I'm so happy to be here um, uh, with you and Alif. To me, art, uh, most of all, is, um, is hope. Um, I grew up in a communist dictatorship, and it was the the subversive songs and the um, brave metaphors in, in poems and in books uh, and the forbidden literature uh, from abroad that kept my family alive. And it was not only consuming art, but also creating it. My father, a uh, geologist, also wrote short stories and poems. And my aunt, uh, a chemist by day, uh, was an artist, she did paintings. Well, I, I'm about to get to your aunt, so... But, but what, what they did is that they inhaled and exhaled art in, and in the total vacuum of communism, art was life. And this is what I think art does. Art allows us to keep our collective daydreaming alive, to keep our subversion alive, and art brings hope. In the darkest of times, this is what we need. We need hope. And art is hope, even if only by allowing us to imagine different possible futures. Mm -hmm. Good. I mean, I really do want to mention your aunt because she was someone you were incredibly close to, and yet she was punished because she was an artist and a free thinker in communist Bulgaria. And I think the regime of communist Bulgaria um, basically diagno misdiagnosed her and said that she was schizophrenic even though she wasn't. And so she was institutionalized for nothing. Um, this, this woman, this young woman, receiving hundreds of electric shocks that damaged her system, that destroyed her body, and sadly, at the age of 37, she committed suicide. And this aunt of yours is someone that you were very, very close to, um, incredibly close. You, you wrote to me, and, uh, or you've spoken and said, art kept her alive. I saw how art can heal. And in a way, your aunt sort of led you to your current vocation, which is to use art to try and make social change, right? This Talk about your aunt and what that means and how it led you where you are. My aunt, um, this you is the... You have to speak louder. Sorry. We, we need more volume. My yeah. aunt, this is the, the sister of my, my father. As I mentioned, she was an artist. Incredibly brave, incredibly outspoken. 
which um, if you imagine a woman uh, with a voice and a, an opinion uh, states being bravely stated in the regime like communism, this is, this is something profound and it's also something very dangerous. Um, my aunt is not at all an exception. Uh, there, this was what communist regime was doing. <coughs> It would either put political opponents or people who disagree with it uh, and its principles in political prison or use psychiatry as a way to deal with them. And so my aunt was just one of many. She was not the exception. She was just someone who was really brave. And yes, Farah, as you're saying, um, she, during her, the course of her short life, she received over 100 electroshocks without anesthetics as um, it was typically uh, done back then. And this led, yes, this, is, uh, this led my, my uh, initially my passion for journalism. I'm an ex-investigative journalist. I spent years investigating institutions for people with intellectual and mental health disabilities across Eastern Europe. I would be going there undercover and I would be exposing um, immense human rights abuses yeah. and uh, inhuman and degrading treatment. But in all honesty, I did this for 10 years. Uh, I was able to close down just one institution with my reporting, and my goal was to close all of them. I was completely fueled by frustration. And, um, and yeah, this, this led my next step uh, as a human rights activist. I am, uh, sorry. To into, yeah. No, to move into yeah. the, the sphere of art, right? Yes. And we'll, I, come back, we'll come back to your art activism. But I want to jump back to Elif, because we are talking about uh, a communist dictatorship which brutalized um, Yana's aunt. Uh, and you are from Turkey. And as we know, uh, you in the Bastard of Istanbul used language terminology that seriously disturbed the regime, uh, the government of Turkey, which means that I would presume that if you went back to Turkey, you might have some trouble perhaps exiting. And. Um, I mean, the theme of this conversation is why art matters. I mean, art matters, but art can also cause all kinds of trouble, and it, it, it has caused trouble for you. So, in a way, you know, isn't your art form also, in a way, a handicap? Because it is creating this extraordinary separation and divorce between you and your homeland. You, you, you are so right. I mean, I, I come from a country where words are heavy and um, being a writer can be a difficult experience. I think being a woman writer is more difficult to be, to be honest. Um, where there's no freedom of speech, anything you say can offend the authorities. So I had a taste of this when uh, my novel, The Bastard of Istanbul was published. Uh, this is a book that talks about memory and amnesia. It tells the story of a Turkish family and an Armenian American family. Uh, but before saying this, maybe I need to share with you the fact that I come from a country that has a very strong and rich history, but that doesn't translate into a strong memory. When I say strong history, it has a long history, but that doesn't translate into strong memory. And I think in Turkey, we're a society of collective amnesia. The, mm -hmm. the easiest thing to do is to forget. So there are these voids, there are these silences, gaps in the official narrative and those gaps are, of course, always filled in by ultra-nationalist interpretations of the past. And anyone who questions them can be labeled as a betrayer. Um, when my book came out, I was accused of insulting Turkishness, even though nobody quite knows what that means. Uh, and it was quite surreal because the words of fictional characters had been taken out of the book and used as evidence in the courtroom which means uh, for a year this went on, there were ultranationalist groups on the streets spitting out my pictures, burning EU flags. And at the end of that surreal period, my Turkish lawyer had to defend my Armenian fictional characters in the courtroom, and then right. we were all acquitted. Now, yeah. I, wish, I wish I could tell you that since then we have made progress, that things have become easier. I'm afraid it's quite the opposite. And if I may add this very quickly, sometimes it's equally challenging to write about sexuality, to write about gender discrimination. So these are also not easy issues at all. Anything you say might offend the authorities in a country where there's no freedom of speech. So for us right. artists, freedom mm -hmm. of speech, freedom of imagination is incredibly important. It's like our oxygen. 
Yeah, and I mean, but you just illustrated the reason why art does matter, because even though you say that there hasn't been enough change in your homeland, Turkey, um, it's still important for you to be able to write your books freely, because you are being read by many people in your own country, right? Anyway, so um, I wanted to sort of go come back to you, Jana, because um, I know that you do uh, your organization, Fine, uh, Fine Acts, uh, engages in, makes artworks that sort of bring attention to social themes, right? So, uh, like I was looking on some of the links you sent me, uh, for instance, in Egypt, um, an artist has created a pyramid of garbage. I mean, there is this area of Cairo where I actually lived um, many years ago, and this area of Cairo is just full of garbage it's, uh, and refuse, and there are people who actually go through it scavenging to look for objects that they could sell because you know, they are impoverished. And to draw attention to this problem, there's an artist who created a pyramid of garbage. And of course, pyramids in Egypt are very famous, the pyramids of Giza, we all go there to visit them and they're beautiful and wonders of the world. But this person um, created a pyramid of garbage and I think that that was an interesting way to create an artwork where you are drawing attention to a problem. Then there was another episode which I heard about through one of your YouTube videos, um, domestic violence. Um, there was an apartment in which a woman was beaten for 50 minutes, 5-0. She was beaten for 50 minutes by her husband. And there were cries, there were howls, everything you want. No one intervened, even though the neighbors and everyone were clearly hearing this. This woman died. And Jana and her group decided to draw attention to this episode by renting the flat immediately underneath and putting a drummer in there. And the drummer was there, bang, 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 banging his drum and making tons of noise, right? It took one minute and 52 seconds for the neighbors to come and knock on the door and say, Oi, what are you doing? You're making a lot of noise. And so here we are, we have this complete, um, you know, clash of humanitarian situation, etc. And so all of this to say that these are artworks where, I mean, the artist is drawing attention, but in a way that is kind of performance or, it's, or installation, in a way that's actually very interesting, right? And to me, that those are interesting artworks, I would say, as someone who covers art full time. But I would say also, I mean, if art is just going to be activist, it can also be just boring, um, it can be like Soviet propaganda. I mean, how do we make works that are actually artworks? Because, sorry my question is so long, but you know, if we were like trying to change things with art, then we would go to Elif and say, Elif, can you please write a book that will try and get rid of the d dictatorship in, or w in whatever country, or try to get more you know, democracy in Turkey or whatever, and Elif would say, I'm an artist, you know? You can't tell me what to do. You can't tell me to write this book or that book. And it's the same with, with you. I was just wondering, you know, how, how, that, how what these people make is art and not just activism. Thank you for this question, Farah. Um, first of all, when I entered the activism field, I started um, researching what makes people care. And we uh, see from science, from behavioral science, from neuroscience, that opinions change not through more information, but through compelling empathy-inducing experiences, like storytelling, like art. That art triggers empathy, as Salif so beautiful, beautifully said uh, previously. That uh, visual language works much better than abstract concepts. So I started thinking, how can we, how can we um, collaborate with artists in order to raise the visibility and raise the support for human rights issues. And I came up with a concept called plativism, which refers to the value of uh, creating these uh, playgrounds, experimentational, play, pre, experimentational playgrounds for um, multidisciplinary play between activists, artists, uh, sometimes technologists and, um, and scientists. But the whole idea is that 
we are not instrumentalizing art. We're creating the playground. So for example, we have a format where we bring together artists and technologists, we give them, we brief them on a human rights issue, but then they have 48 hours to come up with a, with a concept lying somewhere at the intersection between art and uh, technology. Actually, the video that you mentioned, Beat on Domestic Violence, is a result of such a format. I think that art is a tool and this is absolutely beautiful as long as the tool remains in the, in the hands of the artist. I think that we can brief artists, we can give them as activists, we can give them the stories, we can give them the facts, we can give them um, you know, anything that they would need, but then it's absolutely their job to decide how to translate this into an artwork. And for me, this is really important. We should never ever tell the artists what to do. And um, I think this, this, is the, this is a value for us at Fine Arts. Okay. We collaborate with artists, but we never tell them, them okay. what to do. I want to shoot that back to uh, Elif. Elif, um, what do you think of, because we all know uh, great examples of political art, some of the greatest artworks in mankind, humankind. You know, think of Picasso's Guernica. Uh, think of Goya's Disasters of War. These are all fundamental examples of political art but they're coming from the artist himself. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think of this idea of you know, commissioning art to be activist art? Are we, are we in activism? Are we art? What are we? Are we propaganda? Well, it, it, it has to be genuine and it has to come from within, within the artist, for sure. Um, but to be honest, I think if you happen to be a storyteller from a wounded democracy, such as Turkey, such as Brazil, and the list is so long, and that list is getting longer, unfortunately, if you happen to be a storyteller from such backgrounds, you do not have the luxury of being apolitical. You do not have the luxury of saying, I don't want to talk about what's going on outside the window. I only want to talk about my poetry. I only want to talk about my own novels. You can't say that when so much is happening outside the window. Also, I am a feminist. I've learned lots of things from past feminist generations of feminist movement. And one of the crucial things is, of course, that politics is not only what the prime minister might have said today or what political parties did yesterday. Politics is broader than that. Wherever there's power inequality, there is politics. So you might be writing about domestic violence, about child brides, about you know, um, femicides, that too is political, or the personal is also political. You might be writing about, you know, marriage or heartbreak, that can be political as well. However, for me, so in that regard, I am, I don't think a novelist can be apolitical, especially from a non-Western background or from minority backgrounds. But for me, there's a very important distinction. I make a distinction between questions and answers. I don't like the kind of art that tries to teach or preach I don't like it when, a, when an artist thinks they're above and they're, they have to teach something to their readers. You know, I don't know the answers myself. We're all learning. We're all on an ongoing journey. What I do care about a lot and what, what I think a writer's job is, is to ask questions, including difficult questions about difficult issues and create an open space where a diversity of opinions can be heard and then always leave the answers to the reader because every reader is going to come up with their own interpretation. You know, our readings yeah. are unique, like our fingerprints. So yeah. I've met couples who have, who have been married for 45 years. One of them loves the book, the other one not so much. Why? Because the reader is not passive. So all I'm trying to say is I think my job as a, as a writer, as an artist, is to go for the questions and create an open space and then always leave the answers to the reader. We have nine minutes left. Um, if we have members of the audience who want to put questions to these two exceptional uh, speakers, uh, I'm more than happy to call the microphone to be brought to you. So please don't be shy. Um, we love it when we get questions. It feels like we're connecting with you. So um, please do raise your hand if, if you wish to intervene. But the one thing I also wanted to ask is that we've just been through the pandemic and unfortunately that is the sad backdrop to everything we talk about nowadays. And um, I just wanted to ask you, um, as a result of this pandemic, Jana, what you think, how has culture changed by the, been changed by the pandemic and what can culture do 
now in this post-pandemic world? I mean, the world is a different place. I think that um, what the pandemic did was once again to state the power and impact that art has on us uh, and how much we need art to survive. If we all think, what did we do during the, the uncertain and scary days of lockdown, we all found solace and escape and, and happiness and meaning in the embrace of, uh, of books and um, poems and Netflix series. I think uh, this is what um, we need. We need to appreciate the, what art does. And I think this was a beautiful reminder. I know that it was really uncertain times, but we usually take art for granted. And I think that art is um, one of the most un underappreciated ways of survival. And I think that it is, art is a lifeboat that many of us don't even realize that we are on. And now we saw again that we need to keep this lifeboat afloat. Yeah. The same question to you, Elif. Um, just curious, I know you're a writer, but what else, what other types of culture did you engage in during lockdown? What cultural um, genres, disciplines gave you solace, gave you hope and, you know? So, so many of them. I mean, and, I, and I'm someone who very much believes in interdisciplinary conversations. I think we learn more when we engage in conversations across our own disciplines. Yeah. So from cinema to music, uh, I, I learned from many forms of art. But if I may quickly add this, uh, Doris yeah. Lessing, she has this very powerful essay in which she says, literature is analysis after the event. Like things happen and artists need some time to pass, to right. digest, right. and we write in retrospect. I understand that and I respect that. But my feeling is we have entered an age in which, you know, with the climate destruction, with growing inequalities, in which literature also has to become analysis during the event, not only after, but whilst things are happening. I think that's where we are right now. So art, art is changing as well, literature is changing as well. And there's a sense of urgency to respond to this moment in time. But more broadly, I mean, looking at the culture, uh, cultural, uh, out, uh, let's see, the, the cultural um, scene worldwide, globally, um, how do you think it, it is changing? Because we are necessarily going through some elements of change. And how should it be changing as a result of what we're living through? The, the one good thing, of course, is to see how more people are reading books. Um, and, you know, our need for books and art has not dwindled, just the opposite. Actually, it is growing. In an age yeah. of fast movement, we understand the importance for an inner garden to slow down. So art and culture and literature, they're going to be with us for a long time. But I also think this is a moment in which we need to connect better across borders. So it's a moment when we need global solidarity, global conversations, and especially global sisterhood. My feeling is women and minorities have to be at the center and front of this change that we are going through because our voices have not been heard enough. And I would love to see more women and, and especially writers from disadvantaged backgrounds, you know, their voices, their stories, and their untold stories being shared more in the public space. Actually, diversity is the, is the theme of, um, of the next talk that we're gonna have um, today. Um, and it's exactly about that, exactly about gender and racial diversity. Um, I wanted to put that to you, you know, in your activism um, moving forward, uh, how are you going to kind of do what Elif was just prescribing, which is to say foregrounding women who have been invisible for so long and uh, foregrounding, you know, artists who are not um, white artists. This uh, is actually something that we have been doing ever since the start of, uh, of Fine Acts. Um, women, women's rights, LGBT rights, freedom of expression, um, rights of refugees and migrants, and also working with artists from such backgrounds, this, this is an absolute core value of us, so we are only going to be continuing uh, in this direction. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, but, um, so, what, what do you think, Elif, the world is lacking today? 
you know, if you were a cultural administrator, if you were a museum manager, if you were an opera direct, uh, manager, if you were, you know, in one of these positions, what does the world need? There's a lot that the world needs. The world has just gone through so much turmoil and turbulence at the ballot box, outside of the ballot box with the pandemic economic crises. What do you think culture should bring? You know, sometimes people with all the good intentions, of course, they say, when are we going to go back to the normal, the way things were before? There's no way we're going back. I think lots of things have changed. That old world is no more. And we are at a major crossroads. And the decisions that we're taking right now will have a huge impact for generations. What does the world need? Of course, lots of things, but primarily empathy. Empathy has become a scarce commodity, right? A scarce va value very rare. But I also think we live in a world that is bombarded with information, let alone misinformation. So we're living in a world that has way too much information, but very little knowledge and even less wisdom. So how do we change this ratio? Can we focus more on knowledge rather than information? Snippets of information are quite misleading. They make us, they make us arrogant. You know, if I have snippets of information about a subject, it gives me the illusion that I know the subject. In fact, I know nothing. So we forgot to say, I don't know. And that's why I think we need to spend less time focusing on information, morsels of information, but let's focus on knowledge. Knowledge requires us to slow down. For knowledge, you need books, you need investigative, slow journalism, in-depth analysis, and hopefully, ultimately, let's aim for wisdom. For wisdom, we need to bring the mind and the heart together. For that, we need emotional intelligence. We need empathy. So what mm -hmm. the world needs, I think, to change that ratio among information, knowledge, and wisdom, because they're completely different things. Fantastic. Jana, we have about a minute and a half, a couple of minutes. I wanted to just ask you what you think the role of art is moving forward in what you do and in what the rest of the world does. Thank you, Farah. I, actually, I would like to build on what um, Elif just said about empathy. This panel is uh, titled, Why Do the Arts Matter? Uh, specifically, during the times of uh, pandemic or crisis, the, the um, value of arts is put on trial. But if arts didn't matter, why are so many people afraid of them? Why burn or ban the books? Why imprison the writers, why disappear the, the artists? Mm -hmm. Art has a tremendous power. And this power uh, refers to specifically provoking empathy, building bridges across divides that are so artificial, and regimes that are interested in ruling societies that are fragmented and brittle and frightened really, are really afraid of art. Yeah, that's actually um, a wonderful place to end. And uh, I wanted to thank my guests um, from the bottom of my heart. Um, Elif, thank you. Uh, and a warm, welcome, uh, warm regards to you in London. We're here in Doha where the temperature is balmy. I guess where you are, it's less balmy, but. I'm so jealous. <laughs> Very jealous. Um, have a wonderful weekend, and Jana, I wanted to thank you. You are here with us in Doha, and it's been wonderful speaking to both of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.